Welcome to the New Hope Baptist Church Worship Experience with Pastor Leo D. Cyrus Sr. and the New Hope Baptist Church family, where we are reaching the lost, teaching the saved to serve, and giving the world hope in Christ. We hope and pray that the next hour of praise, worship, and the Word of God will lift you up and guide you through life's spiritual trials. The worship experience begins now. The subject of obedience. Obedience. Obeying God. I want to use for subject the obedience of desperation. Sometimes many of us don't obey until it gets to that desperate, till we're desperate. Till we are desperate, then we'll obey God. The obedience of desperation. Get this. The Bible recognizes no faith that does not lead to obedience. The Bible recognizes no faith that does not lead to obedience. Nor does it recognize any obedience that does not spring from faith. Mm. Why, the two are opposite sides of the same coin. 1 John 5, 23, I, thought you, I think you had it on the board and I didn't read it. It says, this is how we know that we are God's children when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is what love for God is, to keep his commandments. Naaman, you know, we, we want God to fix our lives with the wave of a magic wand. Yeah, we, we, we want a prayer day to keep the devil away. And when we say God is just a prayer away, we think that God's are, uh, are, uh, relieving me of my pain and just a prayer away. Mm -mm. No. My brothers and sisters, I'm always reminded that God doesn't need my gifts, my talents, or my so-called titles. Y'all know I don't like titles anyway. What he wants from me is my absolute obedience. Amen, that's what he wants. He wants nothing else but my absolute obedience. I, uh, sometimes he'll place you in a position uh, just to get you to learn how to trust and obey him. Anybody ever been there? He will put you in a position to learn you, to teach you how to trust and obey him. I, I, I think Naaman was a type A person. You know, that's a person who think they can do everything and they can take care of everything, you know. And, and so Naaman's uh, almost something like me, didn't have time to be sick. He was an important man in the army of God, or, or, or should I say in the army of Aram. He was considered a great man in his master's sight and, and he was highly regarded. He was a brave warrior. And, and some have said that he was the soldier uh, at the battle of Ramoth, uh, Ramoth Gilead uh, who shot, killed Ahab. And thus Aram's victory was a tribute to Naaman. But Naaman had a problem. He was all of these things and a leper. With his fame came fear. His power was accompanied by the decoloration of his skin and the open sores that ravished his body. He was a hero in his land, but not one person in his country would have traded places with Naaman. Leprosy was a frightening disease in ancient times. According to the book of Numbers, lepers were required to live outside the city. They were considered unclean. At the time of Christ, lepers were to warn others of their approach by shouting, unclean, unclean. Now, 
God, I want you to get the picture here, was going to kill the leper leader, but not the way Naaman anticipated. The great physician's cure would leave no doubt that it was God actively involved in the work of this situation. God would have to bring Captain Naden, Naaman to a point of desperation, faith, and obedience in order for him to find the cure that he sought. I want you to note that God used a variety of people. I know you didn't see it like this way, but God used a variety of people to bring Naaman to this point. Naaman could have been considered a self-made man. He was a hero, a warrior, and a leader. But to have victory over his leprosy, he needed other people. And as you read this text, you will find seven individuals or groups of individuals who are part of the process reminding all of us that no one gets to God on their own. Now, while we do come to Christ alone by grace, alone through faith alone, we are in reality in need of others to show us the way. Now, let's look at the seven people that was involved. God needs each of us to be one of the seven in other folks' lives. It says, number one, let's look at uh, 2 King 5, 2, and 3. The, little, the first person involved was the little Jewish maid. And see, Amram had, gone, Amram had gone on raids and brought back from the land of Israel a young girl who served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would go to the prophet who's in Samaria, he would cure him of his skin disease. So, number one, the little Jewish maid. Number two, the unnamed individual. Look at verse four. So Naaman went and told his master what the girl from the land of Israel had said. Look at number three, the king of Syria. Verse five, therefore the king of Amram said, go and I'll send a letter with you to the king of Israel. The fourth person, the king of Israel. In verse seven, when the king of Israel read the letter, he took his clothes and asked, am I God? killing and giving life that this man expects me to kill a man of his skin disease? Think it over and you'll see that he's only picking a fight with me. The fifth person was Elisha. When Elijah, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel tore his clothes, he sent a message to the king, why have you torn your clothes? Have him come to me and, I'll sh and he will know there's a prophet in Israel. Amen. That's in verse eight. In verse 10, the sixth person is Elijah's messenger. Then Elijah sent him a messenger who said, go wash seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be clean. Number seven is Naaman's servant. But his servants approached and said to him, my father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more should you do it when he tells you wash and be clean? Seven different people. God's solutions to, solution to Naaman's problem was revealed through others. Never underestimate the important role you might play in the life of another person. You, you may have a friend, a family member, a neighbor, a work associate. Someone needs to point them in the right direction. And often, believe it or not, often God is their last resort, not their first option. Amen. Amen. Often, most people turn to everything, everybody but God. God is their, their, their last option. Now, when people are desperate and dying, it's no time for believers to be fearful of what others might think. Amen. It's time for us believers to obey God and act, asking him for, uh, 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 asking him to use us in the lives of others. And when we obey God, guess what happened? Our obedience 
in, is, it will allow God will to use us uh, and put us in the path of other folk. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and not only that, guess what? We'll influence them on being obedient also. Think of the servant girl. I want you to think of this little girl. Think of her. She was a slave. But she used her condition to serve God and thus bring deliverance to another. Now, listen to what she said to her mistress. She said, if only my master would see the prophet who's in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Now, the rabbis call attention to the particular construction of the sentence, and this is how they render it. If only the supplication, the prayers of my master, could be set before the prophet who's in Samaria. Church Naaman was a hard man, but underneath there was quiet desperation. He was dying, and there was nothing anyone could do for him. But one thing led to another. And finally, Naaman found himself at the door of the prophet's house. Naaman would have known if that, well, he would have known the weird ways of the false prophets of his nation. He would have known that. He would have known of the many gods who promised cures by chanting, by magic, and variety of other methods. Yeah. He was about to encounter the, his first true prophet a man of God with the power to actually do something about Naaman's desperate situation. Now the question is, this is the question, would Naaman listen? Would he obey? Or would he deem the commands of the prophet beneath someone of his status? Would he, would he, would he say he's, he's beneath my status? And you know, church, that's the problem. That, that's it right there. When you try to uh, help folk and teach them right and lead them right, the question is, will they listen? <laughs> Secondly, will they obey? Oh, parents, come on, you have children. Will they listen? Will they obey? Amen, amen. Now, now I, 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 oh, you're right, son, amen. Amen, and not only children, but adults hard-headed. Amen. But, but watch what Naaman did. Watch what he did. Naaman carried, watch now, he carried thousands upon thousands of dollars worth of gold and silver, plus he brought the finest clothes imaginable. Yeah. Naaman showed up at the prophet's door thinking he could buy the favor of God. Yeah. Come on, help me somebody. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that the way we think today? Some of us think we can buy God's blessings. Listen to me, church. Arterial motives lead us to give in order to get. I'm going to say that again. Arterial motives leads us to give in order to get. We give God our grocery list, and we expect him to do what we demand. Amen. Amen. But can I tell you, God is not interested in your silver and gold. He's only interested in our hearts. Amen. Amen. In our hearts. Now, the very fact that Naaman was willing to take the painful and difficult journey to Israel shows that he was desperate. Let's us know he was desperate. He was admitting that the gods of his land had been unable to do what the God of Israel could do. It was an admission of need, yet with conditions. I have a need, but I have some conditions. Yeah, oh uh, uh, yeah. Now, 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 watch this. Oh, I see Naaman in some of us right now. Look, being proud, being a proud man with a great reputation he easily obtained the king's permission to travel to Israel. There, he was given an audience with the king. He had brought some of the treasures of Syria with him, just in case he needed to pay for his healing. Paying for something means you don't owe anyone. Hmm? You bought it. You earned it and deserve it. Amen? 
having nothing to offer for what you need puts you in a position of humility. I'm going to say that again. Having nothing to offer for what you need puts you in a position of humility. God was positioning Naaman to move from dignity to desperation. And this healing would not come through some silver and gold. Come on, help me somebody. And I want to tell y'all, it, it, your money won't get you healed, amen? Sending folk your money not going to heal you, amen? So Naaman, watch this. Look, give me verse, give me the fifth chapter, ninth through the eleventh verse. Ninth through the eleventh verse, baby. So look what happened. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots, and he stood at the door of Elijah's house. And look what Elijah did. Then Elijah sent a messenger who said, Go wash seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be clean. But Naaman got angry and left, saying, I'm, I, I, I was telling myself, he would surely come outside and stand and call on the name of Yahweh his God and will wave his hand over the spot and kill the skin disease. See, let me tell you, Naaman expected special treatment because he, he thought he was all of that. He expected to be courted, bowed down to, and respected. I mean, couldn't Elijah just look out the window and see all those treasures? What else would a pro preacher want than a good retirement? That's why I'm still here preaching to y'all. I can't retire. I wish Naaman would come by here. Amen. I mean, I mean, what else would he want? A wonderful retirement fund. Matter of fact, he could call it quits at any time with no worries or fears if he just net Naaman uh, 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 on Naaman's turn. And that's what Naaman wanted him to do, meet him on his terms. After all, Naaman was a leader. Naaman was a warrior. Amen. And he's at the home of a mangy old prophet. Surely the prophet was desperate for cash. That's what he thought. Naaman arrived with all the pump and circumstance of a high official. He, church, he probably expected Elijah to roll out the red carpet and bring out his finest china. As a hero of his land, he, 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 he had a letter from the king of Syria, which apparently Elijah never bothered to read. Naaman couldn't risk, conceive of a scenario where his arrival, leprosy and all, would not command awe and respect. He couldn't understand that. But Elijah was totally unimpressed with the chariots of Naaman. This prophet was not a healer for high. Mm-mm, mm-mm. What could a man who had nothing possibly offer to a man who had everything? Yeah, yeah. Mm. And yet Elijah was the doorway because he held what Naaman so desperately needed. Healing. Healing. A cure from a deadly disease. Deliverance from the shame of a decaying body. He had what he needed. But this guy's so, so into himself and his status. And the fact that Elijah did not go out to greet him added insult to injury. The prophet, Elijah got one assist, assistant said, come here. Go talk to the renowned captain. <laughs> That's right. A mere messenger gave orders to this military leader. Go wash seven times in the Jordan. Man, Naaman was furious. And that's when he stormed off. He left. And after traveling a day and a night to the home of Elijah, he left in haste. 
because he didn't receive the answer he wanted. I hope you're listening to me. Naaman didn't want to obey. Now, amen. I'm talking to some people. He just wanted healing on his terms, in his way, at his time, but he didn't want to obey. Oh, we got people like that today. We want God to do this, we want God to do that, but we don't want to obey. Tracy, and you know, when I read the Bible, Naaman's attitude was so different from that of the centurion during the time of Christ. In the eighth chapter of Matthew, it tells a story. Put it up there, baby, so they can read it. It says, eighth chapter of Matthew, I think it's five through tenth verse. It says, when he entered Caponian, a centurion came to him, pleaded with him, Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed in terrible agony. I will, Jesus says, I will come and heal him. The centurion replied, no, I'm not worthy to have you to come under my roof. But I only say the word, and my servant will be cured. For I too am a man under authority, having soldiers under my command. I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. Hearing this, look what Jesus, Jesus was amazed, and Jesus said to those following him, I assure you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such a great faith. Watch this. This a centurion was a Roman officer, most likely a tested and decorated soldier and leader who commanded more than 100 men. Amen. The rank and fire would have respected this man greatly. This centurion was called to serve in the barren land of Israel far from Rome, far from Rome. It was an outpost that no one would have wanted. Now, if this man, get this, had not been there, he couldn't have met Christ. Church, circumstances and forces beyond ourselves will bring us to a land that will ultimately lead to Jesus. Come on, help me somebody. Some people try to tell you, man, if that hadn't happened, I never would have been here. Because that happened, I'm over here now, and that's how I got this blessing. <laughs> Circumstances and forces beyond himself brought him to the land and ultimately to the Lord. Yeah. Now, I want you to compare the response of Naaman with that of the centurion. Naaman came expecting to be honored. The centurion came bringing honor. Now, in both situations, we find a powerful Gentile confronting a lowly Jew. But the difference in these encounters is that the Gentile, the, the centurion, had faith. But Naaman had not yet been broken to the point of desperate seeking. He needed to be broken. He needed to be broken. See, 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 the centurion just said to Jesus, you just say the word. You don't have to come to my house. Just only say the word. Now, that's a, far, that's a far cry from riding off in a huff because you didn't get your way. See the difference? The centurion knew there was something about Jesus that was different from anyone he had ever encountered. Both were men of authority who exercised power over others. But the centurion knew that his authority was an ability to direct men and demand their obedience. But he also knew that Jesus had the authority to direct the forces of heaven to heal his paralyzed servant. Amen. And perhaps this, this centurion had observed other miracles and believed by faith. One man was quick to obey while the other was reluctant. And you know, I often find that that is the one factor hindering people from following God, is obedience, yes, yeah. is obedience. Yeah. Let me tell you what we want to do. We want to negotiate with the Lord. Many of us expect 
peripheral treatment because we are active members of a church. Because I sing in the choir, I preach, I'm on the usher, I'm a deacon. Mm -mm. Nah, because I give lots of money. Or they are influential in the community. How many of y'all God don't know God don't work no God don't work like that? Rarely do you find those who say, Pastor, I just simply cling to the cross. Yeah, finally you rather find that mentality in the body of Christ. We struggle and trust and resist the call to obey. We struggle with trusting and obeying the call. Why is that? Why do we struggle and resist the call to obey? Think about that. I want you to think about that. Why? I mean, everything he asks us to do is in our favor. We just read, I read in First John when it says, but you know, if you obey, you're going to keep his commandments. If you say you love the God, God, you will obey him. Don't get quiet on me. Why you don't trust and obey? Yeah, yeah. Why? You know what we do? We like Naaman. We stand outside the door of deliverance. And we demand that God come out and meet us on our terms. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, 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 I, yeah. No, I ain't gonna mess with that, okay. No, I ain't gonna mess with that. See, what we do... We expect God to recognize us even when we fail to recognize him as sovereign and sufficient. Yes, sir. Come on, help me somebody. Y'all yes, hear me sing that song, I'm satisfied with Jesus, but is he satisfied with me? Yeah, I'm satisfied with him, but I, I, I have a disobedient problem. No, let me tell you something. A, guy, a writer by the name of Ron Don wrote an excellent devotion entitled Trust and Obey, in which he says, this is what he says, a car may have a tank full of gasoline, but unless the fuel is ignited, it won't move an inch. Now, I know many Christians whose tanks are full, but they are stalled between the Red Sea and the Jordan River. Full tank of gas, you can't go nowhere. That's all we have time for today. But we invite you to worship with us next week on this network. For more church information, including service times and ministry activities, please visit us on the web at www.newhopebr.com. We sincerely hope and pray that this hour has been a blessing to you. And on behalf of Pastor Cyrus and the New Hope family, thank you for worshiping with us. Until next time, be blessed.